have your Bibles, will you please turn with me to 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 to 10. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 to 10. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Let us pray. Lord, we ask you that you will bless this word for us this morning. Oh, how we need you, O oh Lord. Oh, how we need you to minister to our heart, O oh Lord. You know where each one of us is at. Nothing is hidden from you, O oh God. And so I ask you that you will speak to us very clearly and very personally and that you will work in our lives, that you will be glorified as you do that in us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Over the past uh, few weeks, we have been meditating on one theme, uh, one way or the other, and that is that Jesus is the light who came to dispel our darkness and to give us his light. And today I'd like to build on that theme and ask the question, what does it mean to live or walk in the light? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 5, Paul says, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. Because Christ's light has come to us when we believed in him, we are no longer children of darkness, but children of light. But the question is, how do we walk in the light? John, in this passage that is before us, gives us two things that we need to be absolutely clear about if we are to walk in the light as believers. And the first one is how we view God. And the second one is how we view sin and what we do with it. About God, he says in verse 5, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. John describes God in three words in this letter. In chapter 1 and verse 2, he says God is life. Chapter 4 and verse 8, he says, God is love. In chapter 1 and verse 5, which is part of our passage, he says, God is light. God is called light in various other parts of scripture as well. And he's called light because it describes his moral perfection. He's absolutely pure. He's absolutely perfect and utterly righteous. He is burning with holiness and there is not even a speck of imperfection in him. There is not a tinge of darkness in this God. Even the sun that gives us light has dark spots in it, but not our God. He is absolutely pure. His light not only denotes his purity and holiness, but it also denotes his integrity. In other words, he is truth. There is no falsehood in this God. 
and now because we are brought brought into a relationship with him through Jesus Christ we walk in the light in other words we walk in holiness and truth because god is holy and god is true god says be holy for i am holy it is the character of god that serves both as the basis and the motivation for us to walk in the light it does not just somehow you know birth in us it's not our desire it we did not make it up we did not say okay i need to walk in the light because somehow i feel i need to walk in the light no my friend because if this is a character of god and if you say you belong to god then you are called you must walk in the light it is the character of god that defines or acts as a basis and the motivation for us to walk in the light and so if we are to walk in the light we can never lose sight of who this god is we can never lose sight of his holiness we can never lose sight of his perfect character but second thing is as crucial if we are to walk in the light we also need to understand how we view sin and what we do with it john here exposes three false claims that were doing the rounds in his day and the first one is this in verse 6 the first false claim is sin does not matter sin does not matter the f- false teachers in john's day were teaching that only the spirit is what matters and the body and what you do with the body does not matter at all in other words you can have fellowship with god in your spirit and live as you want in your body now john takes this false dichotomy head on and that's why he says what he says in verse 6 he says if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness we lie and we do not practice the truth John says it is absolutely inconsistent this whole thing because God is light there in, in there is no darkness in him so if you claim to have fellowship with God who is light and then walk in darkness what are you talking about because if you claim to have fellowship with God and walking in darkness John says you are a liar you are a liar your your life is a lie You do not practice the truth you are living in falsehood you can think you are walking with god but the truth is you are walking on living a lie Ephesians chapter 5 verse 8 this is what paul says for at one point you were darkness but now you are light in the lord walk as children of light colossians chapter 1 and verse 13 he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11 take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness but instead expose them 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14 what fellowship has light with darkness light and darkness are not only in- incompatible my friends darkness which is our sin and this is important for us to understand if we have to understand what john is trying to say darkness which is our sin hurts the heart of god it grieves god it affects our relationship with god so john is saying you're you're saying you're having fellowship with god but don't you know that your darkness actually affects your relationship with god because your sin grieves god believers don't lose their salvation but our sin disturbs our relationship with god and that's why john is saying how then can you claim you have fellowship with god while you are 
walking in darkness. My brother, sister, maybe you are living such a life this morning. You have conveniently, you probably conveniently compartmentalized your life. There is this spiritual side to your life. Your, your time with God, your God talk, your church life, your service to the Lord. But then there is this other side, the dark side, your sinful habits, your addictions, your secret lives, your attitudes that you display in your marriage or your attitudes that you display in your home life when nobody is watching you. Now this kind of double life sometimes can give us a sense of assurance that we are walking with God. But in reality, John is saying it is a fake spirituality. It is a false spirituality because you don't practice truth. You are living a lie. There are those who say they love God. But they live neck deep in sin. And John is saying, how? How? How can you say you love God and, and love the very things that God abhors? Because Psalm 97, verse 10, the psalmist is saying, if we love God, then we hate evil. In other words, we have hatred for the things that God hates. You can't love the things that God hates and at the same time say, I am so intimate with God. There is a problem, my friend. Please notice, John is not teaching that we must be perfect because we walk in the light. He's not, uh, not at all talking about perfection. In fact, he exposes that in the next claim. He's not talking about stumbling into sin as we are walking in holiness. He's talking about walking in darkness. The word walk or walking indicates persistent movement in a particular direction. It indicates a lifestyle of habitual sin. How can you walk in persistent habitual sin? Sin and claim and then claim to have fellowship with God. I, I, I watched an Indian movie sometime back and the, the hero, whenever he gets into trouble, this is what he says. He says, all is well, all is well, all is well. Yeah, all is well because you claim to have fellowship with God. But on the other hand, in verse 7, he actually corrects that error. John corrects the error. He says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. To walk in the light then is to pursue a life of holiness. And as we do that, Two things happen, my friends. This is what he's saying. Number one, we live in the light of godly fellowship. We encourage one another. We stir up one another. We are transparent about our lives. We share our struggles. We open up our, about our sinful areas in our life to receive help and encouragement. There is no hidden secret life. But we bring them in the light of godly fellowship and accountability. That's the first one. The second thing is the blood of Jesus, his son cleanses us from all sin. This is a picture of sanctification. In other words, you know, which is our ongoing journey of growing in holiness. As we keep walking in the light, as we keep bringing our sin to God, he keeps cleansing us and sanctifying us. We're talking about walking in the light, and we are talking about, you know, three false claims that John was addressing. Number one is sin does not matter. But John says sin matters, it affects your relationship with God. The second thing is the second false claim was I have no sin. Verse 8. I have no sin. 
John says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. There was another false claim that the false teacher were making and teaching. They said, those who come to know God have been enlightened. You know, like the Gnostics, um, you know, claimed for themselves and they were living on a higher plane and the sinful nature is no longer in them. In other words, they were claiming sinless perfection. And now this kind of teaching appeared throughout church history in various forms. And this kind of misunderstanding is because people don't understand the tenses of salvation. Do you understand the tenses of salvation in scripture? where The Bible says we were saved, we are being saved, we will be saved. And at the time of salvation, we were declared righteousness. It is a positional righteousness. It is our status before God because Christ's righteousness is imputed to us. And although we are given a new nature, the old nature still lingers in us. And that's why God progressively imparts his righteousness to us. And as we continue to surrender to him, we, as we feed the new nature with his word, the spirit of God sanctifies us. And that continues until the day we die or until the day Jesus comes. And until then, God works in us to renew us and to enable us to overcome sin. It is a process. But these false teachers were claiming to have no sin at all. And John says, you're fooling yourself. When you say you have fellowship with God, but walk in darkness, you lie to others. You fool others. But when you say you have no sin at all, you fool yourself. You deceive your own self. You're living in falsehood. And the truth is not in us. My friends, when we live in denial of our sin, you know, this is something that we need to remember. We basically fool our own selves. We deceive ourselves. That's, what the, that's the word that he uses. And as believers, we are in a struggle. The, the, even though we have this new nature in us, we still have the old nature. There is still this sin that is in us. And in the process, we may stumble into sin. But God has made a provision for us when we sin that helps us restore our fellowship with God. And you know what it is? Any guess? Look at verse 9. It says, if you confess your sin, the provision that God has given us is the provision of confession. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To confess is not to minimize our sin. To confess is not to justify our sin. To confess is not to rationalize our sin. The word confess literally means to say the same thing. To say the same thing as God says. In other words, to describe our sin as God describes it, not in lesser terms. It's not describing our sin in vague terms, but calling sin as God calls it. Seeing sin as God sees it. And that's why when we do that, true confession always leads to genuine brokenness and repentance. Now, as we grow closer to God, the more sensitive and the more aware we, became, we become of our sin. For example, Apostle Paul, almost at the end of his life, says, I'm the chief of sinners. That's because the more we become aware, the more we grow closer to God, the more aware we become of our sin and the more we become aware of our sin, the more we feel the need for confession before God. 
when I got saved uh, some 21 years back, the only sins that I thought I had were certain addictions and some visible sins. But the more I grew closer to God, the more I became aware of the depths of my own sinfulness, the deeper the light of God pierced into my life, the more sin he brought to light. Sins I thought didn't exist. Sins I thought looked quite harmless. Sins that were invisible. But the more I saw and the more I continue to see my own sin, the more I see the need to bring my sins before God in confession. Brothers and sisters, every time God brings our sins to light, you know, that is what is walking in the light. When we are walking in the light, the Lord exposes our sin so that we can come before him and confess and repent our sins before him. Every time God does that, there are two options before us. To cover up our sin or to confess our sin. Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 13 says, He who covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. As you are walking with the Lord, as you are trying to walk in the light, my dear friends, is the Lord exposing your sin? Is the Lord bringing sin to the fore, into the light. But the more important question is, what are you doing with it? Are you trying to minimize it or cover it up or deny it? Or are you going to the Lord in brokenness and asking the Lord to work in those areas of your life? Verse 9 is a great, great promise. It says, if you confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness, he's able to forgive and cleanse us, us from. And friend, maybe if you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, and you know you're living in sin, and you know you're, you're filled with guilt, and no matter what you try to do, you know you cannot get the rid of this guilt from your life. This verse applies to you as well. If you are able to come before God, and confess your sin to Jesus. And based on his death on the cross, he will forgive you and cleanse you from everything that you've ever done. We've come to the final claim, false claim, that the false teachers were making. The first one is, they said, sin does not matter. The second one is, I have no sin. Number three, is I have not sinned, verse 10. The second false claim was that there was no sin in them. It's something to do with their sin nature. The second, the third claim is that they have not sinned at all. At least from the time they came to know God, there have not been any sinful actions at all. Now when we John is saying this, when we claim to have fellowship with God and yet walk in darkness, we lie to others. When we say we have no sin in us, we lie to ourselves. But when we say we have not sinned, we make God a liar. We make God a liar because we are exactly saying the opposite of what God says in his word that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that's what the world has always tried to do, isn't it? Deny the sinfulness of man. Humanism has convinced generation after generation that man is fundamentally good. If you studied psychology, you must have heard the name Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud came and he said man is essentially good, but it is the environment that he is in, that influences his behavior, taking away all responsibility from his own sin. 
In other words, man has become a victim, not a sinner. And we do the same in our culture, even in church as believers. We redefine sin. We justify sin. We minimize sin. We no longer call sin, sin. We explain our sin away. And there are times we even play the victim card and say, this is not because of me, because of something else. But this is what John is getting at. He's saying, you know, you don't have to deny or defend your sin. Why? Look at verse 1 of chapter 2. We'll close with this. Chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus, the righteous. John is saying, don't deny. Confess your sin. Don't defend. Because there's someone, there's someone who can defend it better than you can do. We have an advocate right now who defends us before God against all the accusations that the enemy brings before God. He's the one who defends us. He tells the Father, Father, I took the punishment for the sin. I took the punishment for the sin. So my dear brothers and sisters, my friends, the solution is not to live in denial. When God exposes our sin, it's not to defend our sin. It is to confess it and live with humble confidence that Christ, our advocate, defends us. As I conclude, let me quickly summarize what we just saw. We said, we will walk in the light because God is light. And to live in the light is not to live a double life and be careless about sin and say sin does not matter. Only my spiritual side matters. It is to live, to live in the light is to live in the light of godly, transparent fellowship. It is to experience God's ongoing cleansing. To walk in the light is not to deny or hide or cover up our sin, but to keep confessing as God reveals our sin to us. To walk in the light is not to defend or to be dismissive of our sin, but to confess and live in humble confidence that Jesus, our advocate, will defend us based on his finished work on the cross. Shall we look to God in prayer? But I just want to give a few moments before I pray. We've come to the last Sunday of the year. I want us to spend some time to examine ourselves in the light of what God has spoken to us. I want you to think about your life. Think about how you are walking. Maybe you are someone who is claiming to have fellowship with God. But there is this other side to your life. Maybe we need to come before Him and repent before Him. Maybe there are some of us who live in denial. We try to cover up our sin. For, for some of us, it's our image that matters then bringing our sins before God in humble confession. Will you examine yourself, my friend? It's important that you do not just live like this in the coming year as well. That you put an end to this before God, in the presence of God, and ask God to change you. Ask God to help you walk in the light. If you're already doing that and if you're, con if you're already walking in the light, in pursuing holiness, living a transparent life, may I ask you that you will continue to ask God to help you do that.
Lord, we want to thank you for your word. We thank you that you didn't just come to bring light into our life. You call us children of light. You call us to live in the light. You call us to make it our habit to walk in the light. And so I pray, God, that who you are will always be before us. We will never lose sight of your holiness, your moral perfection, that you are the truth, O oh God. So that we are not only, Lord, find our basis and our motivation to walk in holiness, Lord, we also ask you that you will, Lord, remove all false understandings that we may probably have, Lord, about sin. And that you will give us your grace, O oh God. That we will, Lord, never compartmentalize our life in any way. That we will, Lord, live lives of integrity, O oh God. That we will truly walk with you, that we will not just claim to walk with you, that we will truly walk with you, O oh God. And when we do that, Lord, we know that you, Lord, in your love, you will also expose our sin while, we do, while you do that, O oh God. I pray that you will help us to confess, to repent, to turn away from our sin and depend on you, Jesus, because you are our great advocate. You continue to intercede for us. You continue to defend us because of what you've done for us. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.